people pay good money to see this movie. When they go out to a theater, they want cold sodas, hot popcorn, and no monsters in the projection booth. Everyone pretend podcasting isn't boring. Turn it off. speech. I don't have any notes. Uh, I just want to speak from my heart about what I believe this, com- this company uh, is about and what we've tried to do over these many years in building a different kind of company. When people in Germany and in Poland were sent to the concentration camps, they were thrown into rail cars and sometimes the journey was eight hours, 10 hours, 15 hours no light, no, no water, no food. And when they arrived at the camps, the rail cars were slammed open. And you could hear that metal door just right against the cold weather. Men were separated from women, and women were separated from children. And one person for every six was given a blanket. One blanket for every six people. And the person who got the blanket had to decide what to do with this blanket that I have for myself. And not everyone, but most people, most people shared their blanket with five other people. And the rabbi says to me, take your blanket and go share it with five other people. And so much of that story is threaded into what we have tried to do at Starbucks is share our blanket. That was the voice of Howard Schultz, the former CEO of Starbucks. And the subject of the documentary that you're about to hear about called The Baristas vs. The Billionaire. It is a new film by Mark Morey. He's currently seeking completion funds for the film out on Kickstarter. I will have a link to that over at projectionboothpodcast.com. Talked with Mr. Morey about his latest film, as well as one of his earliest films, Building Bombs, and another upcoming project, which will be of special interest to Projection Booth fans, all about the missing print of The Magnificent Ambersons, which we have talked about on this show before. Very excited to see what is turned up from that project. Be sure to visit projectionboothpodcast.com for that link over to Kickstarter. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this interview. Tell me about Baristas versus Billionaires. This is a film that I've been working on with a team of people that I pulled together for, oh, the last year or two, and it's about the Starbucks union drive, the Baristas versus the billionaire, Howard Schultz, the CEO, or he recently retired for the third time CEO of Starbucks. It's about... The union drive, and it's really an amazing story. One component of it is that Starbucks has fired many union organizers for union organizing, which is illegal. And the National Labor Relations Board has forced Starbucks to put them back to work and give them back pay. And one of these cases is coming before the Supreme Court just this spring. How did you even get involved in this case? In an earlier life, I worked in some factories. I worked in a steel mill for five years. I was an activist member of the steel workers union. I had tried to organize a union in a cotton mill. This was all before I became a filmmaker. The issues of unionization and working class have always been close to my heart. And finally, after making all these other films, I'm coming back to my beginning in a way. And I was approached actually through LinkedIn, which is funny, by somebody I didn't know about a film about a particular worker who had lost his leg on the railroad, but this happened many years ago. And when I looked into that case, I said, I don't see how we can make a documentary about this. It happened 20 years ago. But the really interesting thing is that guy is now the writer on the baristas versus the billionaire. After losing his leg while working on the railroad, he became a television writer, was a showrunner on a TV series, He and I are a perfect match on this thing, both former union members and laborers now 
making a film about the current situations. So when she approached me about his story, I said, let's look at what's going on with the working class now and how it's moving forward. That was about the time that the Amazon Labor Union started organizing. And I went down to Staten Island and talked to Chris Smalls, the leader of that union. And there was already a film being made about him. Then the Starbucks union, the Starbucks workers started organizing. I said, okay, let's focus on this. And I just started going out and interviewing some Starbucks workers, some baristas, and then found out that the union started up in Buffalo. So I went up to Buffalo where the first single store had voted for the union and that mushroomed into this nationwide event where now there's 400 stores that have joined Starbucks Workers United. And that is the heart of my film. I know that labor has been under fire for decades now. What do you attribute that to? You coming from Detroit, you've seen this firsthand. And it's no coincidence that the Starbucks Union Drive started in Buffalo because that's another part of the Rust Belt. And it was kids of the old union people who started these, this union drive at Starbucks. But I think what's happened over the last 40 years, really, for the purpose of squeezing as much profit as they can, the ruling class, whatever you want to call them, the corporate power structure, just started shipping jobs overseas. This allowed them to hold wages down, cut wages. And of course, these were also the same people in the same system unleashing inflation on people and people not able to keep up with that. And then, of course, a, a secondary factor, not the main reason, is there's been a certain amount of corruption among union leadership. Some union leaders taking a very narrow approach and maybe some of them becoming bought off by companies or taking a narrow perspective of only not getting so much into political issues, but worrying more just about their own local. And, and it's all of these things have combined to grind down the working class over the last 40 years. But I think what we're seeing now, this whole situation is starting to turn around now. You're getting an upsurge in unionization. It's part of a bigger movement in which people are just saying, we've had enough. We're not going to put up with this anymore. Are there major organizers that are trying to lead this charge across the board? Or is it more of a grassroots movement? Is more of a this place here, this place there, and just different companies trying to union, well, different people at companies trying to unionize? I said some of both. Certainly the Amazon labor union was completely grassroots. They organized an independent union. The Teamsters tried to come in there and Amazon labor union just kept it independent. Now at Starbucks, many of the mainline old unions did not necessarily see organizing service workers. Our economies changed from manufacturing to service. All the man, as we were talking about, all the manufacturing jobs have been shipped overseas. Some of the unions have been reluctant to organize service workers. They're dispersed. You've got 10 or 15 baristas in every Starbucks store, and there's thousands of Starbucks stores. It's not like a factory where you've got thousands of people, and it's maybe in a way easier to organize. But I have to say, the, an organization, Workers United, which is part of Service Employees International, and Workers United has actually defended the descended from the old amalgamated clothing workers union and the international ladies garment workers union to the old line unions they're now workers united and gary bonadonna took saw the need to organize these service workers and started that's how it got going at, at starbucks where are you at with this documentary we are in post-production we're editing it and that's why we have this kickstarter campaign we're doing this completely independently so we can be truthful and we don't have to answer to some corporate person. And it's really for the baristas, for the working class. So we're raising money in a Kickstarter campaign to get the film finished. Did you have to do a lot of traveling for this one? Yeah, we've made three trips to Buffalo and we made a couple of trips to New York City where we did some filming. We went to South Carolina and to some places in Florida where baristas were doing various things. So we've done a fair amount of traveling. Were people all pretty uh, willing to talk with you or was anybody reticent for fear of losing their job? I haven't found anybody that was reticent. Some of the ones we talked to had already lost their jobs. Some have lost their jobs in the meantime, but 
once they got hold of this idea of the union and they felt this kind of strength in numbers and they had a kind of a, a brotherhood and sisterhood among themselves that they came together that they hadn't realized was possible. So they're not afraid and they'd rather organize and risk getting fired, which many of them have, has happened. And like I said, many of them have gotten their jobs restored. But yeah, there was no fear among the workers. They want this story to get out. What they're doing is just, and it's important, and they're standing up. Did you approach Starbucks? What was their take on this whole thing? (laughs) Yes, we approached Starbucks. We asked Starbucks for an interview with Howard Schultz, the CEO. No, they denied us on that. Well, then we said, well, we'll interview anybody, any corporate representative. No, they're not interested. But in the little clip you're going to see in Starbucks, you see just a little slice of a film of of a, a film that comes from when Howard Schultz went to Buffalo to try to talk the workers out of voting for the union. And he made such an idiotic fool of himself that many people that weren't in favor of the union or were sitting on the fence, once they heard Howard Schultz, they were for the union. Howard Schultz anti-union speech did more to convince people to vote for the union than anything else. I think it'll blow your mind because he, in this speech, he says things like, he starts talking about the Holocaust. This is to a room full of 300 baristas. And he says, when the Holocaust, when the Jews were put in the boxcars and in the concentration camps, they only got one blanket for every six people and they all had to share their blanket. And so that's what we're doing. We're sharing our blanket. That's That's incredible that he could say something like that. Oh my gosh. Does he not realize the position that puts him in? No, I tell you how he doesn't realize it. And it's it's one hour of that sort of thing in speech. He's such an egomaniac and so full of himself. And he has surrounded himself with sync offense. They published the full video on their website. That's where we got it. What were some of your biggest challenges making this apart from getting funding? I took the approach on this film I have on one or two other films, which I just went out and started interviewing baristas. I didn't, I knew the Union Drive was an important story, but by shooting, you discover what the story is. And that's how we ended up in Buffalo. And that was a challenge, figuring out where the story is through shooting. I've found that you don't realize what gifts you have until you do start that shooting or even when you're in the editing process. Documentary films are really often made in the editing, but this is the same process I went through on my first film, Building Bombs, which we can talk about in a minute, I hope. But that film, I just went out and started filming protesters at a nuclear weapons factory. And there I found the key characters who had worked at the bomb factory on the inside and now wanted to oppose it. And they became the stars of my film. So we just went out and started filming and discovered the story. It's going to be interesting to have that be one of your first films. And then you're almost coming full circle with baristas versus billionaires. It's the way I like to do a documentary and especially made many documentaries for TV, true crime and that sort of thing. And those are bang. You research it, you write a script, you go out, you shoot it, you edit it, and it's done in six weeks or eight weeks or whatever it is. But with this kind of approach, take longer so more things happen and you actually capture the story in progress. That's really, I think, makes for a better documentary. Now this Supreme Court case is coming up, so that's going to become part of our documentary. Yeah, it's always stuff I imagine to know when to stop shooting. Yes, we've shot most of it, and our goal now is to get the film out. We're going to wait for the Supreme Court decision, which should become by the end of June. Then we want to get the film out as soon as possible after that, because whatever the decision is, good or bad, I think the film can ride that wave because that decision will be a big deal. Do you know when the Kickstarter is going to run from when to when? Yeah, the Kickstarter is going to start on February 21st, which is already happening by the time this goes on the air, I would assume. And it's going to run for 40 days. (laughs) Tell me about your crew. All films are a team effort. And I say Monica Madelich is one of the producers. She's the one who got in touch with me on LinkedIn. And she was working with this guy, Brandon Cross, who was the railroad work, former railroad worker who had lost his leg. 
who had this experience as a TV writer, they became, when I started talking about, let's do something about the Starbucks Union Drive, they were all on board with that. And then I recruited my friend, Bob Judson, who's based in Atlanta, a guy I had known who helped me on my first film. And that's the core team, really, the four of us. Bob has shot a lot of it, and Monica's producing, and Brandon Cross, the former railroad worker, is writing, and that's our core team. And none of us, we're not doing this for the money. We've deferred all of our pay because we all believe in this project and want to get it done. And the Kickstarter will pay our expenses to finish editing the film. Let's go back to your first movie. Let's go back to Building Bombs. How did that one come about for you? I had gone to a year of graduate school where I got every course I could to get my hands on a camera. And one of my friends who was a political activist said, there's this big nuclear weapons factory over in South Carolina, and we're going over there to protest. And he was one of the organizers. And boy, I thought, man, a big nuclear weapons factory in South Carolina. I had no idea that was even there. Who knew about that? So I said, okay, that's a big deal. And the fact that it's secret, maybe that's a good subject for a documentary. So I just followed him over there. And I had a good friend of mine who we had known from the anti-war movement. And I said, I just started, I was just talking to him. I said, I'd really love to be able to make this film. And, and when he heard me describe it, he said, okay, I will shoot it for you. And I'll get the crew and we'll all work for free. You just got to make the monthly payments on my camera that I just bought. That was Larry Robertson. I have him to thank to a large degree for that film being made. That's how that film got started. And I just started filming the protesters. And like I say, I discovered among the protesters, very high up guy who had quit his job to, to expose what was going on inside the bomb factory. The Savannah Riverside is what we're talking about. And there was also a physicist who felt very guilty about devoting his life to making nuclear bombs. So their stories became the heart of that film. When did you shoot that? Late 80s, right? Because it came out in 89? I started shooting in 84 and shot through 89, five years. And that was another situation where the story developed. Chernobyl happened while we were making that film. So we made a specific trip back to show that they had no containment domes on the reactors at the Savannah River site. It was so nice to go back and revisit that more quaint time, even though just to see how screwed up things were. And I don't know if things got better after that. Did you ever follow up on the story? Actually, the film did have an influence for positive change. It wasn't only the film. We, there was, the film was part of a bigger phenomenon going on. The New York Times wrote a series of articles about the bomb factories. ABC News did a series on the bomb factories. And so we were all part of that. So that shed a lot of light on this. And what happened after the film came out, and we showed it right there in Aiken, South Carolina, where all of this was going on, and we had a packed audience. And the, our whistleblower, Bill Lawless, who sacrificed his career to expose how the, the, all this random disposal of just massive amounts of radioactive waste contaminating the water, he sacrificed his career. He was then invited to be on a citizen's review panel to oversee the cleanup of the radioactive waste. And my partner on that film, Susan Robinson, who co-wrote it and co-directed with me, she later went to work for CDC. And you can see her name on a health study that was done of the radiation exposure of the people at the plant. So there's very specific instances where the film had a positive effect on what was actually going on. That's the whole reason you make these kind of films, right? And what's really cool is that the Motion Picture Academy, out of many other films, selected this film to restore, upgrade it to 4K, so it looks better than I've ever seen it. When you're doing it low budget, there's a hair in the gate and there's dirt on the film, and it's not the prettiest thing, but now it's even pretty, I would say. <laughs> so it's now it's going to be re-released again. That's going to be at the International Uranium Film Festival which is touring this spring around the United States. And in a specifically building bombs will screen in Asheville, North Carolina. It's sometime in March. I don't remember the exact date. And we're talking to, we're talking to the Music Box Theater in Chicago. I'm pretty sure we're going to be able to screen it there on March 30th to 31st. It's going to screen at the Jacksonville Film Festival in April, which is where I grew up. That's nice, my hometown. 
is showing it. It's going to screen in Rio de Janeiro as part of the International Uranium Film Festival. Of course, we're just at the beginning of the whole film festival circuit for that thing. I just covered a film called Demon Mineral, and that felt like a companion piece to another one that I covered a few years ago called Downwind, which is all about the effects of radiation and especially all the testing out West. And so this, to see this, to see building bombs right after, I was just like, wow, this, it's been going on for so many decades. The nuclear bomb testing goes back to the 1940s when people in Nevada and New Mexico were exposed to radiation and that radiation was blowing all over the United States. There is many aspects to this issue and none of them have really been resolved. And now today they're promoting nuclear power when the nuclear waste issue is not solved. And I'm not happy about the nuclear safety issue. You've had Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, Fukushima. And now they're starting to build nuclear bombs again. They're cranking up, even at Los Alamos, they're cranking up the production of plutonium. At Savannah River, they're cranking up the production of plutonium again. And here we have this hour-long documentary that shows why we shouldn't be doing these things. And it's like people never learn. It's not that people never learn. It's that the powers that be haven't changed. They're still the same. Plenty of people don't like it, but the, the political power, the corporate political power, they're set in one way of doing these things. Let's talk about something a little bit happier than that. Tell me about the documentary you're doing around Orson Welles and the lost print of the Magnificent Ambersons. This is my friend, Josh Grossberg, who's the director on that. I'm just trying to help him out. I'm the executive producer. But this is, a, this is an unknown story about Orson Welles. And part of my purpose is I want to bring Orson Welles to a new, younger audience who may not be familiar with him. The title we're, we have right now is Exiled from Hollywood, Orson Welles' Lost Masterpiece. Orson Welles made Citizen Kane, many consider the greatest film ever made. And then his second film was The Magnificent Ambersons. And Orson Welles himself, said it was better than Citizen Kane. Of course, that was before the studio butchered it. And what happened was the film was still being edited and World War II broke out. And Orson Welles was asked by Nelson Rockefeller, who was an owner of the RKO studio where he was making these films, to go down to Brazil and make a documentary because the government was worried that the dictator of Brazil was going to go Nazi in World War II. And they wanted him on our side. So they sent Orson Welles down to flatter him to make a documentary down there. And so Orson Welles went to Brazil and Robert Wise, who later became a big time director in Hollywood, The Sound of Music, The Day the Earth Stood Still, a bunch of other films he made, was the editor. And he was supposed to go down with Orson Welles. But because of some war thing, he didn't end making it. And he sent the print of Orson Welles' cut that Orson Welles approved to make some tweaks in down to Brazil. That's the only copy of that version that exists. After that, the studio, while Orson Welles was gone, they cut up the film, they cut a bunch of, they reshot a bunch of scenes, they shot this whole happy ending that anybody who watches the film sees doesn't work, and they just butchered the film. Now, despite that, the film won a bunch of Academy Awards, but it's not the film that Orson Welles intended. And it's not the masterpiece. The version that you see is not the masterpiece that Orson Welles' original version was. Actually, Turner Classic Movies gave us some money to go down to Brazil to look for that lost print. Yeah, I've been following that story as it's been unfolding. And it's a cinephile's dream. I've been wanting to see this. As soon as I heard about it back in film school in the early 90s, I was like, why can't we see this? This is the story of my friend Joshua Grossberg. He was in film school in the 90s, and that's where he became an Orson Welles fan and heard this story. And he actually made a trip down to Brazil in the 90s to look for it. And there's a little bit of film of that we've got. And so we made another trip down there, this time with, with a little more backing a professional film crew and all that and some fascinating things we discovered in brazil now is that one of those where we can't release the film until they actually find the print or is it still going to be coming out at some point no 
I can't say what the status of finding the print is until the film is released, but the film is going to come out regardless because it's not about finding the print. It's about Orson Welles being exiled from Hollywood. And it's a great story. Whether we find the print or not, it's a great story. So what's the status with that one? It's in post-production too. And we need to raise some money to finish that one and stay tuned for that. Where's the best place for people to go to keep up with you and all your work? I'm on Twitter, Mark underscore Mori, M-O-R-I. And I'm on Facebook. And I have an Instagram account. And those are all good places to keep up with me. I do post all of my stuff in those places. Is there a website for Baristas versus Billionaires? Yes. It just it's baristas versus billionaire.com. There's a website there, but the main thing I want people to do, don't worry about the website. It's not very developed yet. If you go to the Kickstarter page of the Baristas versus the Billionaire, you can see a lot of information about the film, a lot of information about the baristas. You see a little bit of the film clips that we've shot, and the whole story of the film is there. And even if you don't contribute, that's the best place to go to find out. Mark, as soon as that Kickstarter goes live, I will be donating. Oh, thank you so much, Mike. Appreciate that. It's good to donate on the first day. That helps the algorithm. And listen, and let me just tell you, I've become such, ever since you interviewed me in 2013 about Betty Pedro Biosol, I've been a big fan of your podcast. I've listened to many episodes. You've been grinding many hundreds of episodes out over the years. And, what, and you get, you, you do everybody. You do the smallest little film to the big Hollywood people. I'm really amazed at what you accomplished with your podcast. Thank you so much. And thanks for listening. Sure, absolutely. And thank you, Mark. Thanks for your time. I really appreciate this. It's, a, it's a, such a pleasure talking to you, Mike. There's a freeway where we played football in the fields. Apartments on the pitch at Highbury. There's a shed called Deer Creek Of which my one critique Is there's no creek now and it's all deer free There's a wall greens where there were no walls Just greenery There's a theme park in a palace in Tennessee That tree there is a pylon But some things you can rely on there's a Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be There's a Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be There's a Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be There's a hard luck story everywhere you look for the old the glory There's a Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be There's a stadium where we used to drink at Freddy's For a team that no one likes or wants or needs They said they revitalized the place Now there's a million parking spaces Maybe bedrooms for the homeless refugees There's a chain store where mom and pop once prospered they're divorced now and they live in penury Their kids grew up and moved away I hear that happens anyway There's a Starbucks where they live, I guarantee There's a Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be There's a Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be And I miss the old Starbucks But the new one's just the same It's got coffee, CDs It's even got the same name You know, I wouldn't have even noticed If you hadn't told me This is Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be There's a Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be There's a hard luck story everywhere you look for the old the glory There's a Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be There's a Starbucks where the 
Starbucks used to be. There's a Starbucks where the Starbucks used to be. 